This is cotton in the fields waiting to be picked. And cotton waiting to be ginned. Cotton. A few years ago, gin operators would gin a farmer's cotton for nothing, just to get the seed. Today, the cotton farmer pays for the ginning, and the gin operator still keeps the cotton seed. That's only one of the problems which a cotton farmer faces. Cotton, that's the subject of today's U.S. Farm Report. everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. Through the weeks on our show, we will be reporting the agricultural scene to you from many parts of the country. Today's report comes from the San Joaquin Valley of California, near Tulare, where two brothers, Albert and George Waddy, farm 900 acres of irrigated land. Al, George, it's a pleasure to welcome both of you to our show. We're glad to be here. Now, where did you all come to this valley from, Al? From Orange County, southern part of California. Now, that's where? Down around Long Beach? Long Beach, yes, in the Los Angeles area. And why weren't you uh, satisfied to stay there? Were, uh, were they making inroads on your farmland? Yes, I'm afraid they were. They, housing took our land. Yeah. We were sharecroppers down there, and they, they, uh, we lost our land, lost our leases, so we were forced to go somewhere. We searched around oh, a lot of different places trying to decide where to locate, and we came up in this area, and mm -hmm. we liked it real well, and we've been here now for about 10 years. What kind of farming did you do predominantly there? Very similar to what we do here. The only uh, really different crop we have here is cotton. Mm -hmm. where we have cotton, barley, sugar beets, alfalfa, same as we had mm -hmm. in Orange County. Mm -hmm. Only our, you might say our main crop down there was uh, dry beans took the place of the cotton here. Now, your family, George, as I understand it, uh, came to uh, that part of California many years ago. Yes, uh, my dad came to California in 1908, and my mother in 1911 from, uh, from Belgium. I was going to ask you about the name Wattie. It's spelled W-A-T-T-E, -E, and uh, it's, it's... Actually, Watte. Is that the way yes. it was pronounced yes. in Belgium? No, in France five generations ago. Oh, I see. That's the... We uh, somehow got adopted to Wadi for, for yeah. ease reasons or something. I'm not <laughs> sure why. But the Wattes then uh, moved from France into Belgium and uh, eventually then to California. It's Southern California. Something like that, yeah. right. Well, now, you mentioned uh, that your production on the 900 acres here is pretty diversified. Uh, Al, tell us in detail what you are raising here. and. Uh, how many acres of each? Well, just roughly. I couldn't tell you to the acre how many acres of each <laughs> we have. But we have about uh, 280 acres of cotton, and uh, which we uh, will quite consistently run a little over two bale mm -hmm. average on the cotton. And, uh, oh, in round figures, 100 acres of alfalfa hay. And, oh, I'd say we'll, we'll run eight to nine ton of hay per acre, it's dry. And uh, barley, barley's a kind of a, oh, when we can't think of anything else to plant, well, we go to barley. <laughs> what do you call and, that uh, kind of a break-even crop? Give well, you something to do or do yeah. you make a little money on well, it? Well, we kind of wish we could break even. I think we're- hey, Francis is trying to get into the act here. Francis is the kid's pony, and uh, what, she about a year old, George? Yes, like about that. a year. Well, leave her alone, she's all right. We're, we enjoy having her on our show. And we we usually end up with uh, about 200 acres of barley, mm -hmm. and uh, sugar beets is uh, we we we'd rather think of ourselves as being sugar beet growers yeah. rather than anything else. Yeah. And uh, we we usually raise 100 to 150 acres of sugar beets. Yeah. 
and uh, we've done real well with uh, with beets and I'd say uh, over the 10 years we've been here we've probably averaged nip to the factory 26 27 ton with 14% uh, sugar. Mm -hmm. How were your beets this year, George? Were your sugar content okay? Yes, it was good. It was very close to 14%. Our uh, net uh, yield at factory this year was 27 and a quarter ton. Mm -hmm. Before coming here to the San Joaquin Valley, we were making a U.S. farm report out of the Amarillo, Texas area, which as you know is a great Milo area and also a great sugar beet area. Yes. And this year, the uh, sugar beet uh, producers in the uh, in the Amarillo area are in a little trouble on sugar content, and they contend that this was caused by extremely high moisture and uh, a disease that maybe you fellas know about called I think it's leaf leaf spot leaf spot mm -hmm. that's it, mm -hmm. and uh, they uh, they were down to oh in the neighborhood of nine percent sugar, which is pretty doggone low, isn't it? Yes, it's very low. Yeah. yeah. Well, now you have uh, raised. Uh, some uh, seed crops, too, that I think we yes. should uh, know about, Al. Well, we wish we knew something about them, too. <laughs> it's kind of a new venture. It's, yeah. It was uh, uh, a matter of economics. I mean, this uh, agricultural picture doesn't look too healthy in this mm -hmm. area, or I don't suppose it does anywhere. And uh, so we thought we'd give these seed crops a try. We had uh, 20 acres of lettuce last year. But uh, we don't know just how we came out on yet. We've just harvested it, and it mm -hmm. hasn't been uh, remilled, so we don't know what our net take will be on it. And now we have uh, a few acres of cabbage, a few acres of onion, and a few acres of carrots, not for human consumption, yes. but for seed again. And you contract with the seed company? Yes, yes. we contract yes. with the seed company. We have a contract price on it before we... Well, this is just another effort to find another cash crop, isn't it, George? That's it, exactly. This kind of thing. It's, it's a necessity. Mm. And it's something you really need in this area. We need another it? crop in this area yeah. very badly. Well, the Waddy brothers, ladies and gentlemen, are certainly qualified to tell us the story of cotton. And so on this week's U.S. Farm Report, that basically is our story. Cotton, as it's grown here in the San Joaquin Valley of California. The state of California, by the way, in terms of cotton production, is number two in the nation, exceeded only by the state of Texas. And so we'll hear the complete cotton story from Albert and George Waddy a little bit later on. But there is another interesting story through the valley, and that's the water situation. And let's talk about uh, the irrigation system and the fact that you really have here a double system, Al. Yes, we have a, actually a dual supply of water, and we have to maintain a dual supply of water because the water that we get in our canals, in our open ditches, is water, uh, uh, snow that's melted, snow melt. Right water. down out of the mountains. Comes right down out of the mountains. And uh, when we have a real short uh, uh, rainfall year, why they don't have much snow up in the Sierras, mm -hmm. and we're a little short on water, so therefore we have to maintain another supply, and we have our deep wells that we can go to then. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's much more desirable to get our water out of the canals, and it's because it's so much more inexpensive to take it out of the canal than it is to pump it from the underground stratus. Well, this is a, a good year in terms of uh, snow melting, isn't it? It certainly is. It's one of the and best we've had ever. So you fellows have been able to just let your wells uh, lie there idle, save your, your well production, and uh, and tap your irrigation system from the right, mountains. Right. What do you have, a, a district uh, set up here? Yes, in this particular area, we're uh, in the Tulare Irrigation District, and it's a system of canals that runs through the valley here, and it's it's a it's a real good system. Yeah. Uh, we uh, we pay an assessment to belong to the system to be in the district, and then we have a water usage which mm -hmm. is uh, very reasonable yeah. when we can get the water. It's quite inexpensive. George, how far down in this part of the valley do you go for water? What's the water table situation? Well, the water table stands about uh, 90 feet today, and uh, during actual pumping, of course, we'll probably uh, deplete the, that standing level by uh, 15, 20 feet, mm -hmm. and uh, the water table is good. We uh, don't feel that we're actually losing water due to our complexity of ditches running through the valley. This may, helps to maintain our, uh, our underground strata yeah. in the, that we use surface water. If we turn all the wells on in, and we have them tied in through an underground uh, concrete pipeline yeah, uh -huh. system, we can we can get about 4,000 gallons 
37, 3,800 gallons a minute. You fellas are in your second year of membership with NFO, right? Yes. Now, what's the NFO situation through this part of the San Joaquin Valley? Uh, a lot of members? Yes, we're, we're getting a lot of new members. It's growing in leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, it's, as far as we're concerned, it's the one organization that we think can really do something for us, and we just, we just have to have it or something like it. Yeah. There's nothing else like it today to can offer us anything. And, uh, we're, we've joined the NFO, and we're real, uh, real happy with the, with the growth in the area. Mm -hmm. And we're, it's real young. But uh, it's up and coming. Well, it seems to me what NFO has been in California, in force at least, for less than two years, hasn't it, George? That's true, yes. How do you feel about NFO? Well, I think it's wonderful. I think it's absolutely necessary. And uh, I, I agree with Albert. The, the growth is, uh, has been tremendous in this area. Why did you fellows join? What brought you to NFO? Or perhaps I should state the question, what brought NFO to your attention now? Well, uh, a neighbor joined NFO, one of the very first people here to join NFO, came over and explained the function of NFO to us and what it was doing. And at the time, actually, that uh, we joined, uh, NFO wasn't strong enough in this area or wasn't organized to the degree that it could do anything for us. Mm -hmm. And our, our actual thought at the time was uh, uh, it cost us uh, a price of a membership and even though it wasn't going to help us it might help a grower back in the Midwest or somewhere else mm -hmm. and eventually it would spread over and uh, come back to help us which it has done it's already done that yes it has. much quicker I guess than either of you anticipated That's right true yeah. yes, yes. you know you told a most interesting story that I would like for you to repeat Al if you don't mind to our audience about uh, that special uh, wheat that you grew here uh, a story that I think, ladies and gentlemen, points out the kind of communications that are being maintained by the National Farmers Organization. Well, we planted 25 acres of wheat last year, and uh, 10 days prior to harvest, where we checked around the local buyers to see what they were giving for wheat, and uh, it was about the same price as barley at that time, which then was about 52.50 a ton. Mm -hmm. And uh, about uh, a day or two after that, we got a call from the buyer and wanted to know if we had this particular variety of wheat planted, and we said we did, and he said, uh, I'd give you $60 a ton for it. And George and I thought, well, this is a pretty good shake, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but we told him, we'd, we're going to wait. We're not quite at harvest yet, and we'd see. The following day, he called back, and he said, have you sold that wheat? And I said, no, and he says, well, I'd give you $65 a ton. So we said, well, we'll let you know in a few days. And we were on the verge of letting it go. A day or two later, we got a call from one of the people with NFO from northern part of California. And uh, he picked up the, uh, the fact that we had this variety of wheat planted on, which we had to state at one of the meetings we'd been to previ previously. And uh, we wanted to know if we still had this wheat. And I said, yes. And he said, you haven't sold it? And I said, no. And he said, would you take $120 a ton for it? I said, yeah, I think we would. And uh, this was just simply, purely a matter of communications. And without NFO, we, we would never have had this well, uh, hookup. The reason uh, for this, uh, this situation was, as I understand it, that the, uh, the producers of this, this special uh, uh, variety lost a crop. Yes. Due and to they the, needed the seed, right? Yes. Due to the excessive rainfall in the valley this year, where they had their plots out for seed for the coming year, yes. they were flooded out and were unable to produce this seed, yeah. and we didn't know it at the time, and uh, we were, I'm sure we were sold it at $65. Yeah. And uh, thanks to NFO, we got 120 These two fellows are known in this part of the San Joaquin Valley as two brothers, a team that raises some of the finest cotton in the world. And we thought we would devote the major portion of today's U.S. Farm Report to the cotton story. Now, fellas, what is the status quo of the cotton rancher? And uh, what do you look for in the future? What are some of the problems and uh, some of the solutions? Al, would you comment first? Well, as cotton farmers, today we're in real serious trouble. Uh, price is uh, just down to government loan, you might say. We're right down to rock bottom on our price, and it's, uh, it's not enough to pay our uh, costs of production. I mean, we're, we're selling it for under our, 
our costs right mm -hmm. now. And uh, I'm sure that uh, synthetics have uh, c cut into our markets. And uh, you're talking about solutions uh, in the cotton industry. I think this uh, Cotton Producers Institute is a great thing. This is this dollar a bale assessment they have to go ahead and uh, work on uh, uh, promotion and research. Yes. And uh, to develop better quality uh, cloth and shirts and what have you, you know, to help our markets. Sure. And I think this is a real step in the right direction. All right. Would you like to add to it, George? <clears throat> yes, you spoke of our uh, problems. Some of our problems, uh, Bill, our uh, uh, verticillium wilt is, has been a real problem to us, beside the price and the rest. And this has taken a cut into our uh, production. And there doesn't seem to be any solution other than the longest possible rotation. That is, the the time between which you will come back with cotton on the same land. Mm -hmm. But this is a real problem to us. Al and George, I think it would be of interest to our audience all over the country, and particularly to those people who are not in cotton producing areas, to hear the cotton story, uh, the cycle of the cotton crop. So let's talk about it. Where does it all start, Al? Well, it's uh, quite a long process, really, if you went into a lot of detail, but it's a matter of soil preparation, uh, pre-irrigation, uh, actually planting the seed, possibly in there somewhere you'd use a herbicide, and um, then you go into cultivation, irrigation, uh, pest control, and uh, then you'd be off into uh, defoliating, picking, and into the gin. Now, does cotton require a lot of water? Well, in this area, we uh, it varies in different areas and mm -hmm. soil types and temperatures and all, but uh, we can usually raise a crop of cotton here with one pre-irrigation and four to five summer irrigations. I see. When does defoliating occur, George? Usually, uh, Bill, when there's about two-thirds, three-quarters of the uh, cotton is actually open. Now, just exactly why do you defoliate? It's done by airplane, by the way, isn't it? Uh, most of it is, yes. Uh, it's done for the purpose of shedding the leaves from the cotton so that it will, uh, you'll be able to pick a cleaner product with your uh, cotton picking machine, assuming that it's picked by machine, which the great majority, of course, is. Well, with modern methods of cotton picking as compared to the old days when it was hand-picked, I can see where uh, the cotton would have a lot more debris in it, and this is uh, one way to avoid that, isn't it? That's true. That helps a lot. And, of course, uh, along with that, the, the cotton ginning process has been, has been greatly changed to eliminate a lot of the uh, trash and one thing or another. And it, mm -hmm. They do an amazing job of turning out a beautiful product in spite of the small amount of leaves and twigs that might still be in it. Let's get to the picking operation. The cotton picker... The machine, the cotton picker, is uh, quite a complicated rig and uh, a little bit uh, dangerous. You have to respect it, don't you, Al? Yes, you do. There's a lot of equipment there, a lot of moving parts, and uh, it uh, it takes a, a good operator. It's just not everyone can get up and mm -hmm. run one. Anyone can drive one up and down the road, but to uh, keep it adjusted properly, keep your dolphin set, your moistening pads uh, set right, and mm -hmm. use the right amount of moisture, this is... Uh, all tends toward getting a good product yes. into the gym. Well, now, you fellas use what is, I guess, the older type of cotton picker, the single row picker. Yes, yes. And uh, some of the newer pickers are what, uh, two row pickers? Yes, two row, the new pickers. What does a two row picker cost today, Al? Oh, in round figures, $30,000. You'd have a little money invested if you were to uh, go on to that uh, newer piece of equipment, wouldn't you? Yes, we would. Now, a little while ago, Al was kind enough to show us the inner workings of the cotton picker. Let's take a look at that film at this time. We're going to take a look inside the uh, door of the cotton picker here and see something that you can't see just driving by. It's quite a complicated affair, as you can see. These are the spindles that actually pick the cotton, and they have, uh, they have barbs and they have smooth places on them. Uh, this head, when it's in gear and going down the row picking cotton, every one of these spindles rotate. And a little later on, well, we'll put the head in gear so you can see what I mean by the rotation. As they rotate through, they move over into this area here on these uh, little pads, moistening pads. 
Each one of these moistening pads has a tube which supply this pad with water. And as this uh, spindle passes over this fin of this rubber moistening pad, it deposits a light film of water on the spindle. The spindle continues to rotate around, pass through the cotton. These barbs roll the cotton up. And they come back here on what they call the dolfer. This is a rubber dolfer that flexes. It's not uh, real firm, it's flexible. And back in the corner here, this dolfer will just, it's synchronized to where it rubs off the smooth spot of the spindle, deposits the cotton down here, which in turn comes up through the suction and back into the basket. And uh, I think now we'll go ahead and roll the, uh, let the head roll for you so you can actually see what's happening. Tell us, what is the capacity of these single row pickers? How much cotton can they pick in a day? A single row picker in, in good weather can get about five acres a day. Mm -hmm. Now, the picker dumps the cotton from its hopper into the, uh, into the cotton trailer. Right. Uh, your trailers are pretty standardized, aren't they, George? <clears throat> yes, they're uh, usually six bale trailers. That's a, that's a trailer 30 feet wide, uh, 30 feet long, and about six feet high. That normally holds about six bales of seed cotton. Now, these trailers, of course, are uh, hauled to the gin mill, and uh, what happens there, Al? Well, they're towed into the gin and they're weighed and uh, usually parked on the lot for a period of time until they can be taken off, and then they're, they're towed in under the suction, and the, uh, the seed cotton is actually removed from the trailers by uh, a suction method, mm -hmm. a steel tube that, uh, with air moving through it that sucks the cotton off of the... Uh, trailers into the gin and into the ginning process. Now, the gin removing the cotton seeds uh, is removing a pretty high profit thing, right? Yes, it is. And uh, as I understand it, in the older days, and not too long ago, in fact, you almost got your ginning accomplished uh, without cost just uh, by exchanging the cotton seeds for the services. Yes, but that's changed, hasn't it, Al? Yes, it has. Due to the uh, lower price now on cotton seed, where we used to go in and uh, take our cotton in, we would get uh, possibly a dollar, maybe two dollars a bale mm -hmm. credit. And now it's costing us somewhere between five to seven dollars a bale over and above the mm -hmm. seed. Now, you talk in the cotton business about percentage of usable product. Is that a good term or a bad well, term? Well, we, we call it turnout. We percentage of turnout, which means the the net amount of cotton that you get out of uh, out of what you haul to the gin, this is correct. Uh, which uh, contains uh, debris. I don't. I use that term. There are what three items: moisture, uh, moisture, dirt. moisture, lint, foreign matter, yeah, and seed. And so uh, after all of that is ginned out and the seed is taken out, uh, what is left is turnout. And what percentage of turnout do you fellows accomplish? Well, now this year we're running, I'd say, probably uh, 30, about 33 and a half percent. Mm -hmm. We have some better and some worse, but that's a, that would yeah. be a good average. Yeah. What about uh, uh, bad turnout? I suppose that uh, some cotton farmers do not take the care that you do to bring that cotton in there as clean as yours is, and uh, they're paying for ginning of uh, those, uh, by or those, those foreign particles uh, that's absolutely unnecessary, isn't it? Well, this goes back to several different practices. I mean, a good defoliation job, we mm -hmm. feel as though, uh, helps us, and uh, see that your pickers are in good condition, and that you don't pick when the cotton is, uh, has uh, heavy dew on it, no. and start too early in the morning, and, uh, the operation and the operator and the overseeing of the machines is very important in this. Well, it would seem that uh, 
The cleaner the cotton, the better the cotton farmer. Your gin manager here in the Tulare area, Mr. J. Adney, has some very uh, flattering and complimentary things to say about the Waddy brothers and uh, their cotton. Well, they are top producers, period. And uh, so far this year, I would say they, they are, uh, have the top grades of not only in this gin, but I uh, would defy any gin to uh, match their particular particular grades. Production-wise, uh, I understand from uh, hearing stories around the uh, country, there, there again they are excelling. What is the investment in this kind of a cotton gin? Well, to replace this cotton gin today would probably run somewhere around $400,000. George, how much do bales weigh? Well, a <clears throat> uh, bale of cotton is commonly referred to as 500 pounds. However, there is a minimum and a maximum, but uh, 500 pounds is a standard cotton bale. How is cotton graded? Well, it's graded by a government classing office, and it, uh, it uh, middling cotton is your standard of good cotton, and it goes on down to uh, strict lows and good ordinaries and on down. Uh, we feel that uh, on a good year, a good fall like we have this year, we're picking probably 95% uh, middling cotton. And uh, this usually goes in direct uh, uh, ratio of uh, good turnout. And just uh, generally a good job in good weather, you will get uh, uh, good grades. What does the government inspector actually do? Does he reach in there and grab some cotton out of each bale? No, they come on the, on the bale yard and they uh, cut, uh, cut part of the burlap wrapping from the bale and take a sample of each bale. Mm -hmm. And then this is, it's not graded right on the yard. It's taken to the government classing office and they have professional people to do this. Mm -hmm. Each bale is classed individually. Is cotton graded according to what, fiber length, George? Is that the way it's graded? The, yes. the, the, the longer the fiber length, the higher the grade? Yes. There, there are a few things which, uh, which determine that, but the fiber length, and well, and that's in direct proportion to its strength. And this is done by hand, manually, but it takes many years of experience, I understand, for these people to be able to determine the difference between uh, staple length of an inch or an inch and a sixteenth or whatever the case may be. This has been a most interesting experience for me and I want to thank both of you for being on our show. It's been our pleasure. Albert and George Waddy, two outstanding farmers and ranchers from the San Joaquin Valley of California. U.S. Farm Report is seen on this station each week until we meet again Goodbye, everybody.